People love to measure things, and you can measure ketones, right? Beta oxidation happens inside the cells in the mitochondria, and it's powerful, but it's very difficult to measure directly. And ketones really are, are sort of a proxy. I'm not discounting them, they're, they're important biomarkers, they are used as a fuel source, but when you're talking about real fat, fat metabolism at high rates, beta oxidation is doing the heavy lifting. You know, it's the base work, it's the stuff you don't see. So that's kind of the, the big things. And then ketones, your, your liver can make, when you're fat adapted, your liver can make plenty of ketones, which is a, a very mobile, it's like glucose, it's mobile, it can be utilized, taken up and utilized very quickly in the cells. Um, it substitutes, it's a substitute, it's not a, it's not like a secondary fuel. I think in, a, in fat adapted athletes, it might play a first line role, it might play a second line role, the glucose, but they're very interchangeable. And then, and I think there's certain things for higher intensity where glycolysis, where you run, you know, the need oxygen deficit, you're not, you, you know, you're going into glycolytic spectrums, yes, but for that aerobic spectrum, I think your body interchanges ketones and glucose pretty easily. Hey guys, welcome back. It's Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. As always, I'm super excited and grateful. I'm honored that you're here. This is an awesome show with Peter Defty. Peter's been dabbling in low-carb, high-fat applications for, for sports, for endurance athletes, and also strength athletes alike for the past 17 years. He's really a pioneer in this field. No one 17 years ago that I know, very few people I should say, have been doing this type of work for this long. And he's great friends with Stephen Finney, Jeff Volick, and many others. And he was part of the Faster Study recruiting subjects for that. I'll put links below that uh, below this video to that study. Uh, you should be familiar with it, at least you've heard about it if you go to seminars or listen to podcasts. So it's an awesome discussion, particularly if you're interested in learning more about uh, carb cycling, if you're interested in learning more about how we really burn fat for fuel inside the mitochondria and different you know, exercise intensities and how those affect fat burning and ketone utilization. It's an awesome show brought to you by our friends over at perfectketo.com. The suppliers of high quality MCT oil formulations, exogenous ketones, and now a low carb, high fat, whole food derived bar. It tastes phenomenal and it has negligible, if any, impacts on your blood sugar levels. So you can save 20% off in your order by going to perfectketo.com for Josh H I H. Again, that URL is perfectketo.com for Josh H I H. And be sure to use a promo code H I H, the number two and zero at checkout to save 20% off on your order. So with that guys, let's dive back into it with Peter. I'm very excited to be with my friend Peter Defty. Today we're gonna to talk all about his experience helping athletes balance uh, their fat adaptation process and utilize carbohydrates as you were talking offline, yep. almost as performance enhancing substances, or you said PEDs, which I think is- Yeah, yeah, I, I look at them as a legal PED. Yeah. Because, you know, um, concentrated carbohydrates, you know, if you look at them from that lens, they make sense because do they enhance performance? Right. Right, right. Oh. But are there long-term consequences to taking too much? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's kind of, before we kind of, you know, unpack everything that you were talking about there, how did you get into this? Because I think it's been a 17-year journey now. Yeah, it's been a 17-, 18-year journey for me. I mean, I started it personally after I did my first marathon around 2000, 1999, 2000, and did the traditional carb load and had the wheels fall off and systems shut down. I finished the marathon, got a Boston qualifier, but I should have ran a sub three hour marathon then. And I said, this doesn't work. And, and so I said, this is, what did the Maasai do? So they, they go all day on a, a diet of meat, blood and milk. And I, so I ate, uh, you know, I started increasing a lot of protein and fat in my diet and had a little bit of carbs. And I did three marathons after that and had no issues. When you say issues like no bonking. No bonking. Okay. No bonking. Just ran through them like, you know, no, no tomorrow. And then that started me on my personal journey. I started coaching people in 2003, 2005, some close friends. I said, hey, you know, for ultras and trail running, you really need to be doing this. And we were seeing these results. And then in 2006, I ran the Western States 100-mile endurance run. It was my first 100. And... Um, Somebody threw me some Vespa and said, hey, you got to try this stuff. It, it, it works. My friend Mojo, who's a cyclist, swears by it. And so I was already open to the whole idea of burning fat for fuel. So I used it. I ran the 2006 Western States. 
Um, I was one of the 43 finishers who got under 24 hours that year because it got super hot. It was like half, only half the field finished that year. And that led me to discussing more with this whole Vespa because I was really committed to the fat adaptation thing. Mm -hmm. um, people thought I was crazy and everybody was laughing at me. And, but, you know, I knew it worked and we started doing it. And in 2008, I started, uh, I bought, you know, a, an equity share in the company and started marketing it. And that's when it became a day job. And so what I found was in, in marketing the product, I was seeing this, this variation where some people would say it worked, some people it didn't. Uh, everybody was still laughing at me. Uh, you can go to like Scott Dunlap's blog. He's a trail runner and the first, he did something in 2008 and just you see the comments and I, we were just ripped to shreds. Mm. But what I started to find was this consistency, you know, is you as a cyclist, you know, what are you told these smash down? Carbohydrates. Tons of carbohydrates. And, and what we found were people were just, everybody in endurance is like smashing the carbs down. And Chris Carmichael was saying, you got to eat the carbs. And so what we found was when we started to take the carbs out, everything started to work. And that got me thinking, well, what's going on here? And because I have a, a biology degree from UC Davis, I, I started to look at the literature, look at the textbooks on physiology and, and always keeping in mind that original thought about the Maasai and then what were the, those evolutionary pressures that shaped us as humans. And, you know, just coming to the conclusion, you know, we were underutilizing our ability to metabolize fat for performance because everything had gone, High shifted carbs. so far, you know, the, the American way, if a little's good, mm -hmm. a whole lot better is going to be more. Yeah. And that can only last so long. Right, right. Yeah. Very interesting. So, yeah, yeah back when you were in the swing that got into Vespa, that was kind of the peak of this high carb era. I mean, no, no one really that I knew was talking about, uh, about, you know, fat adaptation to, to the level. That Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that period of 2006, Six through 2010, that was like carbs were king. And Louise Burke, one of the top sports nutritionists in the world, said, We got to put the nail in the coffin. She wrote an editorial in a journal mm -hmm. saying, We got to just quit this whole idea of fat adaptation. It's ridiculous. Yeah, she still hasn't stopped, right? She stopped. Well, she actually wrote a paper one week after Faster got published mm -hmm. saying, Maybe we need to reconsider this whole thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, Wow, that was quick. And then, then, I, then somebody close to me, um, who's kind of the guru in, in keto, said she probably was an anonymous peer reviewer mm -hmm. of the FASTER study. And, and so she's changed her tune, but sort of. I mean, I think she's still kind of, you know, pro-carb because, you know, all the literature for performance kind of really says that. And as an academic, she's got to go with what the body of science says. But FASTER is kind of making everybody rethink that. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> That time period, you know, you know, at that time, everybody was all about carbs. And what happened is in 2010, a friend of mine sent me a news article from the Sacramento Bee saying, hey, this guy's kind of talking the same language you are. And it was Steve Finney. Mm. And Steve happens to live in Elk Grove. And so we got together for lunch and that was sort of a seminal meeting because here was a guy, he was the first researcher that said, no, you're not full of crap. You're actually onto something here, I, I, you know. He, you know, he doesn't say I believe it, but he knew, he knew there was something to this because of his bike racer study back in the 80s. Right. Okay, where he, where he took a bunch of high elite a cyclists who were on high carb diets and then got them keto adapted and got very interesting results from that adaptation. Okay. Um, and so, that kind of sat for a while before, until the faster study? Oh, it, 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 after he published that, <clears throat> and he published some other papers on, on ketosis, and then he actually went into that study trying to prove that carbs were king, mm -hmm. like keto didn't work. And it, it's like, here's the data, and it worked. Uh, what happened is at that time, that was in the early 80s, and, and that was at the time that the, the dietary guidelines were being developed. Mm -hmm. And what happened was his field of research, ketosis, it became toxic. Yeah. Literally, some of his... Some of his um, colleagues who were on that paper had to find other areas to research because, you know, you'd be literally blackballed, blacklisted in academia. Mm. And so this was, when we met in 2010, this has been something, a latent interest of Steve's for, for decades because he knew the performance angle of it. Mm. But because it was toxic and everything was riding on the carbs, you know, he was like me, <laughs> you know. 
Um, except he has credentials. <laughs> right, right. He's a, and so, but you know, he, he had to keep, and so that meeting was sort of seminal because I had somebody now who's a credentialed researcher who really had published you know, in high tier journals and impeccable research and clinical. Mm -hmm. I don't know if a lot of people don't realize that Steve has a really good clinical background. In the 90s, he did a weight loss clinic in the, in the Sacramento area that's very successful, even to this day, I got another doctor bought him out, but he developed all those protocols. So he has both the clinical and the basic research uh, background. So it was a seminal meaning because, like I said, it gave me somebody credentials that was saying, no, this is real. But for him, all of a sudden there was a group of athletes doing one sport that all of a sudden presented a pool of people they could get real data from. Because, you know, Phil Maffetone was doing training for fat adaptation. He was, you know, doing some diet, but not the really sharp restriction you need. Mm -hmm. but, but it was like with, you know, uh, Mark Allen here, Stu Middleman there, Mike Pig there. So they're in different sports and it wasn't enough to get data. So it was always these kind of outliers that you know, people would say were just anecdotal. So in 2010, that led to us starting to just loosely collaborate. I mean, we weren't collaborating as scientists, but because I'm an empiricist. Sure. Um, but he found um, somebody who had a group of athletes, and that led in 2012 at Western States, we did what was called the Western States Study, which never got published, but the data from that we took you know, we had a pool of high carb athletes who were running Western States and a, and a pool of fat adapted athletes. And the data was so compelling in terms of recovery and performance. And, the, and, and in fact, that year, the guy who won was one of my athletes. Mm. And he set the course record that stands to this day. Wow. So, you know, there, there's something to it. And that was sort of the, the spark that led to the faster study. Mm which was Finney and Bollock, Dr. You know, Jeff Bollock and Steve Finney's study on, on looking at metabolic differences between high carb endurance athletes and, and high carb um, and low carb. So you said there were some biomarkers of the data in, in uh, you call it the Western State study where there's just kind of un, unpublished. It was a yeah, it was unpublished study. It was pretty compelling in terms of the different metabolic characters. Well, the biggest thing was just how quickly the, the, the fat adapted athletes bounced back. Mm. From race to race? Or from, from the end of Western States. Like they took data like two or three days out and then they had them take a week out and send it in. But for three days they kept the participants close by and they came in and took blood draws and, and uh, cheek swabs because uh, cheek cells turn over pretty quickly and you can see a lot. They were, and they took some uh, cheek cell swabs in the race at different points too. Mm -hmm. And what do you attribute that to? Less inflammation? Less well, inflammation is one thing, but really less oxidative stress, less lactate load, because mm -hmm. um, you're making that fundamental shift to a lot more beta oxidation, mm -hmm. you right. know, which also you're producing ketones, you're producing glucose, you're, you know, you're taking in a lot less calories. Mm -hmm. Yep, love it. So before we dive into the details of the FASTER study, which I think is, is fascinating, and just something came up that does come up a lot is, you know, is there, what's the difference between, uh, you know, utilizing ketones for beta oxidation and fat burning? So I think they get kind of obvious. Well, this is, this is one of the things I've been saying for years because when I first started looking at this and the physiology, and this was before the whole ketone, keto thing became, exploded, is when you're talking, I, I like to use the term fat adaptation or fat metabolism because when you look at it, it's, it's really about beta oxidation. But beta oxidation is very sexy. It doesn't sound very sexy. It's, and it's complex. And I just, I just was, um, thanks to Mike Julian, I was watching a video yesterday. And it's something, this is, it, it was a, it's a theme that I've been thinking about. But they said if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. And this is something I've been tossing with because a lot of the things I do are very like intuitive. And, and I look at the science and look at the data. But people love to measure things. And you can measure ketones, right? Beta oxidation happens inside the cells in the mitochondria, and it's powerful, but it's very difficult to measure directly. And ketones really are, are sort of a proxy. I'm not discounting them. They're, they're important biomarkers. They are used as a fuel source. But when you're talking about real fat, fat metabolism at high rates, beta oxidation is doing the heavy lifting. You know, it's the base work. It's the stuff you don't see. So that's kind of the, the big things. And then ketones, your, your liver can make, when you're fat adapted, your liver can make plenty of ketones, which is a, a very 
mobile. It's like glucose. It's mobile. It can be utilized, taken up, and utilized very quickly in the cells. Um, it substitutes. It's a substitute. It's not a. It's not like a secondary fuel. I think in a, in fat adapted athletes, it might play a first line role. It might play a second line role to glucose, but they are very interchangeable. And then, and I think there's certain things for higher intensity where glycolysis, where you run, you know, the need oxygen deficit, you're not, you, you know, you're going into glycolytic spectrums, yes, but for that aerobic spectrum, I think your body interchanges ketones and glucose pretty easily for those metabolic needs that require ketones or glucose, whereas, you know, that base energy production is being done by beta oxidation. Mm -hmm. And ev even in that, you're, you're spinning off oxaloacetate, acetate, I, I'm not really good with this, and then you're making ketones inside, you know, that gets converted to acetoacetate immediately and gets metabolized immediately rather than gets dumped in the bloodstream. So you can't even measure the ketones you're making yeah. during that whole citric acid cycle. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny though, so many people um, get excited about having high levels of like ketones, but no one gets excited about having high glucose, you know? So I think we get, we get confused that ketones really are energy substrates. Yes. And, and so, for, for some people, I mean, most athletes I've found in, in myself, like my ketones don't get very high because we're, we're we can t I can tell you we're adapted. Yeah. So so talk about that because so many people are ch they're testing their ketones and they get excited that they're four millimolar or whatever. And right. To me, I'm like, I don't know that I would be excited about that. But well, you know? well, a lot of the performance, what we see with a lot of the, the the athletes that are doing OFM, which is a very highly fat adapted state, but we're looking at the performance, so we are using some carbs and stuff that a lot of times, like in the morning, we see that their, their serum ketones are actually low and not clinically in ketosis. Mm -hmm. We see a shift towards lower, and it's, it's not what's in your blood when you're an athlete. It's not what's in your blood, it's what you're burning. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a different metabolic set point when you're well adapted. And so, and we even see a lot of these athletes ha run, tend to ha run high glucose. Now, there's a spectrum. So some people, depending on if you're a hyper responder or what, you know, some people will pull higher blood ketones and lower glucose. But we see a trend to what people are doing more higher intensity, more competitive racing stuff towards lower fasting ketone levels and fairly high glucose. And the interesting thing is post exercise is where it's really interesting because that's where you can kind of track what your body's doing by proxy. Mm -hmm. Because my, 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 my thinking is that your body is going to, when you're fat adapted, your body will produce, mainly hepatically, the, the energy substrates to meet the metabolic need. So if you're doing something, and say you go out and do a fasted run or a ride and you hammer at the end, we'll see, I've had people, even Dr. Edwards just called me up in the middle of the night because I told him, he says, holy crap, my, my, my blood sugar's 165. Mm -hmm. I've seen people go as high as 200 post-exercise that their blood glucose will just spike. But as was shown in, in FASTER, that's a transient thing that, that immediately gets stored into glycogen. Right. But what happens is you, you have this upregulation of all the systems to produce the energy to meet that metabolic need, then you stop. Well, it takes a while for that system to shut down, so you get these spikes. So we see a mild ketone rise, and then we see often a very sharp blood glucose spike, because when you stop, because you're fat adapted, your body's gonna to prefer to burn the ketones and the, and the beta oxidate, use beta oxidation. And then all of a sudden, it's just the, the glucose starts stacking up and, and, and it just elegantly gets transferred into glycogen stores. Interesting. Yeah. And so that was one of the interesting findings of the FASTER study is that the keto adapted athletes or fat adapted athletes yes. uh, tend to replenish glycogen despite not eating the carbohydrates. That's exactly it. That, that, that's what a lot of people miss is, is they were restoring their glycogen levels just as much as the high carb athletes, but they weren't taking in any carbohydrates. Interesting. And and it it you know everybody's saying that's novel, but that's what we've been seeing, and it's it's this. And then what we saw, I've been seeing for years, is these these really sharp glucose spikes post exercise. Mm -hmm. So if people aren't aware of this information, they may get a little scared and think, oh my gosh, I'm pre-diabetic or something else is going yeah. on. But this is a very normal, especially I think the, the operative word there is if they finish off or if the workout includes some glycolytic demand. Threshold, yeah, higher intensity where you're pushing your glycolytic or you're pushing over into glycolytic spectrum. You know, it's going to signal to the liver, hey, we need some glucose. And because you're fat adapted, you can make plenty of glucose from fat. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to catabolize my protein. Well, it's not quite that 
you know, everything changes, you know, and, and, and part of what we need to understand is the context. And this whole thing about where that spectrum of, of serum ketones lies is the body of science in ketosis right now has been, been performed on relatively sedentary subjects. You know, when you're, when you're talking about people who are... Diabetic. Or right, diabetic, people who have reversed their type 2 diabetes, epileptic seizure people, um, or people trying to lose weight, it's, they're relatively sedentary compared to ultra-endurance athletes. And so what we're seeing is when you build up that fat adaptation via performance athletics, it's, it's a completely different animal. You know, it's like, you know, the cholesterol values. Um, when, when Dave Feldman was shopping his cholesterol stuff at Low Carb Bale, that was the first time he came and talked to people about it. You know, I was the guy that said, my God, this is fantastic. You know, everybody's like looking at us, this is interesting, and, and they weren't too sure, but I'm like, oh, I was all on it because we were seeing in, in our athletes these guys would have these super high LDL um, values because that's what the liver was doing, was sending out all these LDL particles as energy packets to meet the metabolic demand. So we're seeing the, the fat adapted athlete is a completely different animal from a different your phenotype. Yeah, from the straight hardcore keto. And so, you know, the problem is right now is is like where I am is in this, this weird space where I'm not in the keto camp, even though I believe in nutritional ketosis, but I, and I'm, I do, you know, we use carbs, but you know, I'm not in the, the high carb camp too because there's unintended consequences, you know? And so it's, it's, it's kind of hard. And I think people are gravitating towards this. I know a lot of uh, people who I've helped coach and stuff that were out there and have big followings are talking about this now, but um, it, it's, you know, it's part of that whole binary process and, and how things become fads and people think one way or another. And mm -hmm. like we were talking earlier, you know, I've had people call me up and say, well, I can't buy Vespa. It's got four grams of sugar and they're like crap in their pants. And then, you, you know, with the keto, you have a lot of people like if you get above 50 grams, you know, that's it. That's all it. It's all, all of a sudden yeah. we fell off a cliff and it's like, you know, what we're seeing is like, you know, typically 75 to 150 on a normal training day, but you know, for races or big training loads, a, 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 a young male who's not metabolically broke, it's pretty much like in line with the original studies that came out of Sweden on carb loading. Mm -hmm. These guys can smash three, 400 grams before a race, and, and they're doing that with fat and protein too. They're not just straight up naked carb loading, but they can do it and they're gonna get a huge kaboom and it's not going to impact their ability to metabolize fat. Right. It's not right. like they're they're kicked out of ketosis permanently and no, then they no. need to go six months later and Right. Yeah. And even I've a, I've got a, a, a female athlete that's in her forties and she came back from a parasitic infection. Um, and we brought her back and she did four weeks ago she did her first ultra. And she was just in an event this um, weekend where a bunch of keto people were there and they were measuring it was the first time she'd had her blood measured and she said, even after dinner I was at Point five, mm. you know. Even high carb during that specific. It wasn't high carb. It was a normal dinner. They had potatoes. It was like your normal hotel event, you know, a meat dish, uh, vegetable dish, and some potatoes, right? And and so, and and wine, lots of wine. And so she had two or three glasses of wine at dinner, and you know, after dinner, point five millimolars, and she was like three or four all day. She she didn't eat all day. She ran in the morning, and kept going. So. You know, you just don't you just don't get kicked out of ketosis, and I'm finding, and and myself personally, and then the athletes I work with, we can do stupid things and, and you know, eat complete trash, and then the next day, boom, you're right back in. So that that window of carbohydrate tolerance and flexibility opens way up when you get fat adapted, and, and I'm talking really about aerobically fit. And that's that's very key is is getting that aerobic engine built up and, and there's a lot of, you know, you hear a lot of talk even in the keto community how you don't need aerobic exercise. You can do just high, you just need high intensity interval stuff, which I'm not knocking, you do need that too. Okay, very important to do high intensity stuff to push this, challenge the system, but you do need to, what we're seeing is when you build that aerobic base on a fat burning physiology, it's, it's huge. It's, it's tremendous because, again, look at the body of science. What's it based on for cardio? Right, uh, high carb based. High carb based. So 
it's not it's not the cardio that's doing it. It's the fact that if you're doing a lot of cardio, you're doing a lot of exercise, but you're fueling it with a lot of sugar, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if you're doing- People don't make that association or that connection. That's, right. that's profound. Right. It's like, like if, you're, if you're doing a lot of exercise and you're fueling it with sugar, that's, you know, everybody knows sugar's bad, right? right? So that's, that's kind of the, that's what people are missing is, is that context of why it's done. And what we're seeing is, it, you know, it, it's funny because because Amy said that about, she's seeing that right now because she's doing, she does, teaches strength and conditioning. This is the gal I was just referring to. Mm -hmm. And she says now she's got this big aerobic engine from her ultra running, she's going into classes, strength and conditioning, ropes classes, personal training, and she's just killing her, her students. And a lot of these guys are like high school and college kids, you know, competitive athletes. And she's just, they're, they're just dead. And here's a 41 year old woman with four kids, or three kids, and she's just, you know, she went and taught a, a high school wrestling thing, and, and, and she said, the, you know, gave, handed them all a can of whoop ass. Yeah. And then I had another gal, Lindsay Boston, up in Reno, who Rob Wolf put us together, and she said she lost her match, and, and, and she said, what, what's different? Something's different. What's different? Is it, and she just had knee surgery, so she hasn't been running. She said, I don't have that aerobic engine I need. Hmm. So it's, and the same thing with Doug Berlin, who is one of the, athletes profiled in the art and science for low carb performance. Mm -hmm. Guy was a career uh, bodybuilder, gym rat, he owned three Gold's gyms, really successful. And when he started, when he built that engine and he went back into the gym, he was just laying people to waste. Yeah. Because that mitochondrial density, capillary density, like that foundation is there. That's, that's the whole thing. And that's what I don't get, what people don't get is first build the potential of the, the energy, oxygen, delivery system, right? Your, 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 your heart, your lungs, your veins, your capillaries, your microcapillaries, and get them, you know, get that microcapillary biogenesis to feed the muscle cells so you build, you know, the type one slow twitch, and then you build a lot of type 2A, the aerobic fast twitch, instead of, you know, if you don't have that system to feed it, you're gonna build, put on a lot of type 2B aerobic, anaerobic slow, fast twitch muscle tissue. Right, that's why people get all pumped up when they just do a lot of gym work without building their cardio. Does that make sense? Oh, totally, yeah, but you don't have the network, the foundation, the infrastructure to deliver nutrients in, pull away waste. Pull out waste, yeah. carbon dioxide, right? So, so this is why I say is like, you see this, and then the other thing is when you get fat adapted, you lower that inflammation. And I got this out of reading a lot of studies on type two diabetes and heart disease journal stuff and textbook because you get this hard arteries right that's a classic point yeah. when you get fat adapted you get this huge arterial distensibility and and so and that's why the whole blood pressure and salt myth is is you you know you have hard arteries and you start pumping more fluid through your blood and you add more salt your blood volume goes up mm -hmm. and if your arteries can't grow your what happens to your pressure right, right? Yeah. but when you got that thing that's why you know like Finney and Volk say you have to add salt and fluid to your diet because, especially when you're performing and sweating, because you have that ability. It's not just creating more, it's their ability to grow. Those pipes can grow and deliver more fluid. Right, wow, very, very yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Um, but, but let's go back to this, dispelling this binary myth. You know, I get this comment all the time where, where you know, on YouTube and stuff like that, where you know, we've done a lot of this ketogenic diet, you know, type discussions with people like yourself. And, and uh, if you have a banana or something before you work out or during a workout, you're all of a sudden not on the keto bandwagon anymore. But, you know, so, so for folks that are identified with keto, should they, why should they not be scared? I mean, you already said it, but just reinforce it. Why should they not be scared to add in carbohydrates, particularly if the workout is intense, where they're training for something or doing an event? Yeah, I think it's first it's important. I, I've gotten a lot of athletes talked to, worked with, and seen a lot of athletes who are doing hardcore keto. And there's a spectrum. I'm not saying there's, there's some hyper responders who do really well on keto, on pretty much straight up keto. But, and if you're metabolically got some compromise of like type two but diabetes, like, like what Sammy Inkinen had went through, he has, to, he has to stay a little bit more strict, right? But if you're not metabolically broke, that window opens up. And what we've seen is a lot of people, particularly females who try to do hardcore keto, um, they'll dig themselves big adrenal holes. Not adrenal, I, I, I don't like the term adrenal fatigue because it's, it's not accurate. I, adrenal stress mm -hmm. would probably be more appropriate. And so, um, 
you know, because your body, you know, when you get to that pushing that level of, of pushing up to your glycolytic spectrum where you're going anaerobic and stuff like that and your body's like, I need some quick energy and it can't find it so it looks harder and it, it starts to, you know, the cortisol starts to go up and there's nothing to feed it, you know, and you're shutting down and people are just digging themselves adrenal holes. So we see a lot of that and... Mostly females though. Mostly females, but not entirely. Like I, we've had some people, like a lot of males that, you know, high stress jobs, you know, a lot of cortisol and, and they're just, you know, the first thing they actually start to lose weight when they add the carbs back in so they can get through their workouts comfortably. Hmm. You know, we have, a, you know, the same thing with, it's sort of like the inverse of the people who are doing high carb diets and they start increasing from a 5K to a 10K to a half marathon, they start gaining weight. Yeah. Oh, same thing, same thing with the, the, the hard, a lot of hardcore keto people, particularly if they're in a chronically stressed environment mm -hmm. where their cortisol, they're pinging their cortisol a lot, they'll tend to actually put on weight even doing keto. Right. right, because there's the training volume's high and the life load is high. So exactly, gotcha. and so they're 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 and, and the, we give them a little carbs to help them push through their workout comfortably, and then they lose weight. Yeah, you know that's a really good tip. Yeah, uh, well, we do know. Oh, I've read some research on how androgens affect the liver's ability to synthesize and make ketones. So it seems yeah. like there is some sort of you know gender differences there. The, the, well, and it's it's like I say, you know, with men we're simple. You know, you feed us, you bleep us, you, we put us to bed. That's, that's, we are that simple. Yeah. And everything with a woman, you know, from her brain hardwiring to her hormones, everything is very complicated. So it's, it's a much more delicate balance with females. And, and, you know, they tend to stress easier, which is another factor than, you know, where are they in their cycle? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it makes for a very dynamic <laughs> environment. Yeah. I mean, it's not that men don't have issues or, or need to look at it too, but it's, it's 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 much it's been much easier with for to to manage performance athletics for a a male than a female. But once you can get a, get that woman dialed in, she kind of intuitively knows and she feels she feels safe. I think for women, having a sense of security both in their home life and in what they're doing and commitment, if they, that's a big thing. And it's like I say, you know, the stress stress is as big an issue as the carbohydrates yeah. in fat adaptation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what about sleep and other lifestyle factors? Oh, absolutely. You know, circadian rhythm, you know, the whole thing like we were talking with Charlie here about, you know, non-native EMF. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, I think, I think that all these things are pinging our cortisol and our dopamine and things that don't get us to burn fat. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole thing of texting and IMing and, you know, it's a distraction. Yeah. And, and I think that these things, um, these are, these are, all these things, they're innate and they're, they're in our hardwiring. Um, but it's like I say, it's, it's the environment, stupid. Yeah. We so alter the environment that all these things that, we're, that are, we think are bad are actually make a lot of sense in the environment that shaped us as humans, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you look at the whole process of eating a lot of carbohydrates and the insulin and what it does and all that. It's like it makes total, it's elegant, it's beautiful in the context of Seasons, and seasons, right? And you know, when fruit was ripe, you had three to five days to eat it, and before it went rotten. Right. And so you got while well, the getting was good, and, and you you know you eat that fruit, you get full, you pass out. Two hours later, you wake up, you're full, you're bloated, but guess what? Yeah, you're, you 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 you're put hungry. on some yeah. So that natural, you know, and then the whole thing with appetite. I mean, both the differences between male and female appetite. I mean, it's there for a reason because that's what got us up to go out and get food, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and same thing with why women's, women's hunger triggers are much more sensitive and, and they put the weight on much more easily and they give it up much less. Well, you know, from a biology standpoint, I'm not sugarcoating this, I'm not trying to be sexist or anything. It's just like women are, were shaped by biology to be eating and saving for two. Yeah. And, and, and like I've said, keto is the big party with women. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, the, it's the default. It's, 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 but it, for them to get there, they're saving it for the big party, which is late gestation, childbirth, and lactation. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in mammal species, most of the males go off in bachelor herds, so you can't depend on the man to be around, right? right, right. And, and I was talking to another guy that was saying, like, before the advent of agriculture, you know, women like bonobos would, would mate with various males because the male wouldn't know whether that was his child or not. And so if one male got, went off hunting and got killed or went to war and got killed, you know, the other male might think that those are his kids. It was very interesting. Wow. 
and, and the whole, whim, you know, women are a lot smarter. They got clever because, you know, they couldn't just, you know, they figured out real quick how things worked. Things worked. And it's like, you know, man, he can just grab a woman, have her way with her. And it's like, you know, and then women figured out how to, you know, you see how women know how to work it. Oh, right? yeah, big time. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but totally. it's, it's just kind of like their brains are much more complicated than ours. Right, right. So when it comes to manipulating diet or dietary extremes, take more caution, maybe, potentially. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's all contextual. And what I've learned is it's, it's very individualistic and very holistic. And, and part of that binary thinking comes out of the whole thing with science because everybody's saying, where's the science, where's the science? And the science is important because if it wasn't for Steve and Jeff's faster study, people would still be laughing at me no matter what athletes were, were getting the results because yeah. now it's got some science behind it. But that binary thinking of, the point I want to make is science is looking at, when you're talking about biological science, it's looking at a certain aspect, one certain, trying to focus on one certain aspect and control the variables. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is we interpret that as sort of an absolute in that binary thinking. Okay, so we're looking at, say, insulin, and we, you know, too much insulin is bad. And then you, they're controlling all the variables. But when you look at the real world, it's multi variables, and a lot of these variables are dynamic, and it's all swimming around. So people don't realize that a lot of what the science is meant to do is to help us understand a certain thing, and then how does it fit into the larger context. And just like insulin, you know, everybody's got the, you know, the keto sphere, and I'm not knocking it. It's just everybody's like, insulin's bad, insulin's bad. Mm -hmm. But in the context of somebody who has low basal insulin and is insulin sensitive, insulin's very anabolic, mm -hmm. right? And that's what makes little animals and babies grow big. And, and I was telling a friend the other day that, you know, their, their kids shouldn't be totally keto because you want some of that insulin to give them that anabolic response because they, they haven't hit puberty. And that's what makes them, helps them to make grow. It's one of the most anabolic hormones when you're, when you're low insulin and insulin sensitive. Right. right. Bodybuilders inject insulin for that reason, post-workout. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And just like what Dave Feldman's kind of articulating about LDLs, okay, in the environment that we live in now that has too many carbohydrates, our bodies can't metabolize the, the LDL lipids. But in a, in a fat adapted ultra runner, all of a sudden the lipids are doing exactly what they're meant to do. Mm -hmm. So that binary thinking is, is one of those things. But you know, like we're here sitting here talking and probably people are, we're losing people right and left because we're talking about all this crazy thing and you're like eating it up because you get it, but it's, it's not an easy sell. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make great America great again here. It's simple, you know, <laughs> right. It, it's it's one of those deals because people latch on to yeah. to these ideas. <clears throat> Insulin's right. bad, LDL is bad. But you know, going back to that example of Dave Feld Feldman, I think it's a, you know if we think about what LDL does is a trans. It's like a taxi cab. It's transporting lipids around. So it's a dump truck. Yeah, you know, there's more stuff in the system. There needs to be more cars in the road to de deliver out that to the periphery. So That's right. And you know, and, and it's like it's like you know if you got this this dump truck that's meant to take energy to rebuild the cell to fuel the cell and all that and it's got and it's like trying to go to the cell but glucose is like cutting in right like steve says it's a metabolic bully and then it just keeps driving around inside the arteries and all of a sudden you got all this inflammation from all the glucose cells and it's got to stop and do that and it's it just accumulates and, and it's not yeah like i said you know it's the environment stupid if, if we can just look at how we get ourselves back to that natural thing and that's why the way I've structured the OFM program is to make it real easy and doable and, and think of it in this sort of evolutionary biology, anthropology um, platform. You know, like, like what were those pressures that made us robust human beings? You know, it's like when you look at most of your, globally, the, the, the savanna hunter-gatherers, whether they're the Maasai and the Hudsu in Africa, or the, the Mongols in Mongolia, the high steppes there, or the Eskimos and in Inuits following the caribou, or the, the, the people in, in Finland with reindeer, or the Plains Indians. You know, these were robust people, right? And so, you know, one of, one of the uh, revisionist history questions I, I ask is, is why one was, one was one of the principal reasons that the Great Plains was one of the last places settled on the continental of the United States. Do you know? Uh, I have no idea. Well, one of the main reasons was because the Plains Indians were literally head and shoulders taller, fiercer, stronger than the white man. Mm. 
and it, when, when General Custer got slaughtered, literally, at Little Bighorn, the U.S. Army and cavalry would not fight the Plains Indians in a head-on war. Okay? And it wasn't until they figured out if they killed, out the buff, killed off the buffalo, they could starve out the Indians, which is exactly what they did. That was what the Trail of Tears was all about. Hmm. Because they were literally, you know, a, a, a different level of human being in terms of their, their, their physical agility and, and, and cunning and all those things. It's like when Lewis and Clark convinced the, great, uh, the Osage chiefs to go meet the great white father, Thomas Jefferson. He was a tall guy like us, six foot two. And the, he said, these men are giants. So, you know, that was, and these people were, were basically on a pretty much ketogenic diet, you know, and, um, and so, because they were following buffalo, okay? Now, one of the misconceptions, uh, you know, besides bringing carbs back in, is this whole thing about meat, and, and, and I like people to eat the whole animal, which means they got to eat the organ meat, the skin and connective tissue, as well as the muscle meat. Americans eat way too much muscle meat. Mm -hmm. and, and what I've found, and what we found is, is just eating that diet of, of vegetables and the whole animal is when you get this really down, it's about nutritional density, nutritional balance. The amount of food you really eat is very little, and especially when it comes to the animal foods. So it, it's like you really need very little. So you're not necessarily promoting veganism or being a vegetarian, but the fact that you're getting such nutrient density from a diverse array of, of components of the actual animal. Yeah, but a lot of people think that if you're keto or you're paleo, you're just yeah. you're chowing, down. chowing down the 16-ounce yeah. ribeyes every Baking day. On everything. Yeah, 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 and it, it's, it just amazes me. It just continually amazes me how little somebody needs to eat mm -hmm. to be robust health and actually perform well. And now, now, when you're doing these big events and you do need calories, but relative to what somebody else would be taking in, it's a fraction or it's, it's significantly less. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, I think that that's, that's really key. Um, I've noticed that in my own life. My wife and I too, we eat anim animal meat is now like dessert almost. You know, that we, we don't have every single day. We have eggs and things like that, but yeah. we haven't lost, our body composition hasn't changed. We've gotten leaner but our strength and everything is the yeah. same. We, we can do more with less. Yeah, a lot less. I mean, and, and like I enjoy my steaks and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Neanderthal. But, <laughs> but it's like, it's just, it just, I don't eat that much anymore. I just don't need much. Because I do, I do make sure I get some sort of liver product. If I can get sweet breads or something. And, you know, me and my little kids go and eat menudo con pata, mm. sin grano, because of the gelatin. And we, you know, I supplement with gelatin when I can. Mm. Um, but... You know, you just get that balance of a lot of seafood. So, it, you know, it's just, you eat so little and you perform so well. And one of the big correlations that's sort of a standard is the less you eat, the longer you live. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And I, I just think that, that just a little bit of animal products, you know, um, makes a big difference. And we've seen that with athletes who are vegetarians, like a couple that are, you know, ovo-lacto. I've gotten them because they're so performance-oriented. I've got them to take desiccated liver capsules and, and gelatin capsules and boom, injury stop, performance goes through the roof. Wow, and that's, that's amazing. It's just, just, just a little tiny bit. Mm -hmm. Rich Roll, have you connected with him? No, yeah, no, one. no, yeah. yeah he, Is he still he, vegan? I think so, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it would I, be interesting to see, you know, if he'd be open to something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, no, I know Scott Jurek, and Scott's a great guy, but, but, you know, I think these guys, you know, the vegan thing, when you look at the simple thing of, of the digestive tract of a human, we're, it's much closer to a dog's than a pig's. Pigs and bears are true omnivores. We're omnivorous carnivores. It's like I say to my vegetarian friends, I've got my eyes in the front of my head and I only have one stomach. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you can do it on a, on a, on a plant-based diet, but it, it, it's just very complicated. And even, even my wife was watching some videos on veganism because for some reason she got curious, and she's a research scientist. Mm -hmm. And she said there was a doctor who's a vegan. He was saying you got to do this, this, and this because you can't get this from a plant-based diet. So even the well-educated people in the vegan community know that, you know, you need some certain so, things, supplements that you get from a bacterial source rather than an animal source. Hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's kind of circle back a little bit to the seasonality of this now that we're coming into winter. Mm -hmm. It makes more sense, you know, days, you know, the feeding window is smaller, you know, if we eat within our circadian rhythms and carbohydrates are not going to be very available. So is that another element kind of layered onto this, this whole circuit, like eating within the seasons? And it seems that we'd be human beings, particularly in North America, would be more keto like this time of the year. Yeah. You know, that's a good point you bring up. And, I, you know, I, I've always approached it like one of the things we try to do is we make sure everybody's on our mega dosing protocol, vitamin D mega dosing protocol because of the lack of sunlight. And, um, you know, because of this, you know, you're signaling to your body to hold on to more fat. You know, people tend to gain a little more weight. Um, but um, I do see that the window, the, the feeding window does close down and you, you know, you have that afternoon, early evening feasting period and then boom. Yeah. And it seems to work uh, pretty well. That's what I do. That's what a lot, a lot of my athletes do right now. And the training window kind of goes down. But, you know, people also can fall off the wagon really easily too with right. this kind of yeah. situation. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So even maybe being keto would help them stay on the wagon, potentially. Because yeah, crave and, and as Jeff Follick says, once you get this down, it's a luxurious diet. So, you know, as we go into the holidays, there's lots of great options available if you know what to look for and what to stay away from. You know, there's lots of rich food that, that's pretty, pretty fat adapted friendly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also you can enjoy things. One of the things, the other things that's kind of interesting that's not keto and not even quote unquote healthy, but when you're well fat adapted, alcohol and fructose actually become really usable fuels energy substrates. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing you can, like during the season, you can enjoy alcohol like wine and hard spirits. As long as you don't know, I'm not yeah. advocating yeah. like, like you know, you and me going out and turning it on tonight, you know, but you know, because fructose and alcohol are metabolized very similar in the liver and converted to fat. Well, when you fat adapted, instead of accumulating, your body just grabs it and makes it into ketones and glucose the next day. Right. You know, you've heard these stories where somebody will get ripped and they'll have the ride of their life the next day, right? Yeah, I've heard that. You know, yeah. young guys, and it's, it's because of that. Mm-hmm. You know, Very that level of fat adaptation. So, yeah. so you can enjoy life. And, you know, there's, and like I say, with your ability to have some flexibility, you can have a, some of the desserts, but you just can't start feeding on the Christmas cookies, right? Right. But, I mean, like things like creme brulee, these rich kind of desserts, like I had flan last night and a little mm -hmm. cheesecake after dinner. Yeah. Didn't eat all day. Right, right. Awesome, Peter. Well, this has been great. Let's kind of finish off with what is Vespa and how does that help athletes? Okay, yeah, Vespa is, this, this is one of those things, because Vespa is hard for other people to understand because we're, we're using it as a catalyst, not calories. And like we were talking before, you know, with the keto movement, now that fat is a viable fuel source, everybody's coming out with these fat-based products, right? MCT, okay. exogenous ketones, you name it. MCT, C8, C6, C12, yeah. C16, um, ketone esters, ketone salts, fat bombs, and everybody's going crazy about that. But we're really about trying to get your body to metabolize fat on its own. The, the body will, when you're fat adapted, your body, for not forever, but for a pretty good period of time, it'll produce the energy it needs to meet the metabolic demand. And so Vespa is a, the main ingredient is a wasp, what we call a wasp extract, but it's, it's really a, a natural, biologically active peptide we get from the, the giant Asian wasp. And, and wasp bees and termites are all like super strength, super endurance animals. Hmm. And the wasp we get from flies like 60 kilometers a day and carries its, a third of its weight in food ball. Wow. And it was one of these accidental discoveries of some Japanese entomologists who were studying this, this, the life cycle of this wasp. And they're saying, well, what makes it do this? And so they started studying this and, and found out that this wasp has to have this peptide that the larva feeds to it to, to be able to metabolize the fat in its thorax at a high rate. And they hypothesized because animal cells are remarkably similar across species that it would have a similar effect. And so they've done mice studies and rat studies and you know, even humans anecdotally, you ask anybody that uses Vespa, they'll tell you it works, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but the science that's been done on it is, is not what I would call really good science, so I don't like to put it out there. That's part of the problem of, of knowing people like Steve and Jeff and my friend Bruce LaBelle, and my, my wife is a, is a research scientist, and she gets published in the top-tier journals in her field. Nice. And so experimental design is, is a big thing, and, and that's part of the problem is most, most of your nutrition and sports nutrition stuff is, 
is not even science. Yeah. So, so it's a biologically active peptide that triggers your, your cells on a, on, a, on a cellular level. I think it's working on the mitochondria to metabolize fat at a very high rate. Nice. Yeah, and I've got, we've got, you know, I was just on Facebook talking to a guy who just did a test and he didn't even have a crossover point. Mm. And I've had some other stuff where some other athletes have done tests with the Boulder Center for Sports Medicine and they had to run the test twice because they never crossed over. Hmm. They just kept, went, went right up to their threshold, their aerobic threshold, burning fat, and then wow. the carbs just started to come up. Very and so, you know, there's just been a lot of, of um, there's been a lot of success with the product since it came out in 2000. Mm -hmm. um, people won the Olympic marathon. Sammy Wanjiro used it in Beijing. Naoko Takahashi set the world record and won the Olympic gold medal and back then using it. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, it's a lot of anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence and, and we've got a lot of people like, you know, uh, using it, but that's, but what we've done is we, we developed the OFM program around supporting those Vespa users, but it's become its own thing. And, and once again, this is a catalyst where, you know, our whole approach is not to, is to work with the body system. Mm -hmm. not so you have to, to be doing the work too at the same time. Not, not necessarily. Most mm -hmm. of, a lot of my people were people are you, you doing a high carb diet, huh. but the synergies when you, when you do the fat adaptation with the Vespa are great, and then when you bring the carbs back in, it's like rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. It's like they work better using less. And, and so that's how we get that performance push to, so people can you know, win races, um, set um, records. And it's not, it's not just, a lot of people think this is just an elite thing, but we have regular people all the time, like, like you know, Amy. She's, she's a, you know, a mother of three kids, training, running. Um, just had a guy named Daryl Peterson who completed four over 200 mile runs in less than four months. Wow. And he set PRs, you know, and it, after two weeks after completing the first one, he set two PRs in the mile, 10K, 5K. And then after he did the third one, five days later, he did the Marine Corps Marathon and ran a 321 instead of 23 minute PR. Wow. And the guy's a Marine, so he, so he has to maintain combat fitness. Mm -hmm. Like after this last one, he did the Okinawa survival run. He, he tested the Marine PT, got a 300, which is a perfect score within 48 hours of finishing the race. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's another important part that we ought to cover though, is it's not that, what people notice with, with both fat adaptation and Vespa and the whole thing is, it's not that you recover faster. You know, everybody says, oh, recovery, right? That's mm -hmm. a big subject. And you, sure. you talk about the lack of oxidative stress. It's not that you recover faster. It's you haven't done the damage in the first place. That's much more profound than just recovering faster. Right. That's why, you know, Daryl can do a PT in 36 hours after a 200 mile event, you know, the Marine Corps PT and score mm -hmm. perfect. And why he can run a PR at the marathon five days, he, it's not, he actually gets the super compensation, not the recovery, right? right? So he keeps getting stronger. Now, is the damage not occurring due to not as much lactic acid output? Well, lactate, lactate is a marker mm -hmm. um, and, and your body will lose, use lactate effectively, the heart, the liver can use, uh, but up to a, up to a certain amount, and then it kind of, then you start to see that build in lactic, sure. lactate level. So it's a marker, but then there's also because you're burning sugar, and uh, and so I think what happens based on Steve Finney and I talking is you get a lot of oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, and so that's that's what's happening, and I think that 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 really does a lot of damage. One of the things that the, that the Western state study shows was, was just how much damage it does to the cell membrane fatty acid compositional problem. There's just a lot of oxidative stress and that's got to be impacting your mitochondria too. Yeah. And so I think that's the big thing is you're just not having all that damage done. Right. And then plus when you metabolize fat, this is another thing that's really important about getting the nutrition, not just getting fat calories, but getting the nutrition that's in fat, which is you're dealing with the cholesterol mm -hmm. le system, the lipoproteins, the fat soluble vitamins. You're also giving yourself the nutrition in a way that optimizes your body. So you're not doing the damage and you're getting that, that optimal nutrition, right? right? So yeah. you don't get that, that damage and you, 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 then you get that, the, you know, the hormesis from the stress creates that super compensation mm -hmm. um, environment so your body gets stronger. That's what training does, right? right? But when you're not doing the damage, you actually get stronger, faster. Right, right. 
the adaptation occurs quickly. Right, not, very quickly. It's not like taking two steps forward, three steps back. Kind of right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, really yeah. fascinating stuff. Yeah. So, um, so, so where can folks learn more about Vespa? If you're interested? Uh, VespaPower.com. Okay. Um, I'd say follow Steve and Jeff's work. There's more to come there. Um, is it like a gel or is it a capsule? It's a drink. Okay. So it's, a, it's a little drink. Um, and we have a concentrate which you dilute in water, but it's, it's basically a liquid. A lot of people, a lot of my early adopters were um, people with GI issues mm. um, because it, it's easy on the stomach, plus they took in so much less calories they weren't having you know, the GI issues. Versus all the maltodextrin and dextrose needed. Well, we, you know, it goes back to all that sugar and the, yeah. the re reactive oxygen species. And like your, chel your cheek cell, cheek cells, but also your epithelium, the, the lining in your stomach and the mucous membrane, all that reactive, that's the first thing to get impacted. And you, you see with a lot of, you know, endurance athletes and cyclists, you know, they'll go for a decade or two and then all of a sudden yeah. they've got an higher gut. And then, but you're, you know, it's like I say, I look at the, the epithelium as sort of a, a, a tropical rainforest canopy, right? And, you, and, and, and it, therein lies the biome, you're, you're, the human microbiome resides in there. So you have all this form, it's like, like you know, going and burning the rainforest for cattle. You know, it's, it's, that's what all that, that, that putting, that's a byproduct of putting all that sugar through your system. Right. Yeah, people don't think about that unintended consequence. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, of that. Very interesting stuff, Peter. So, uh, super. So, best practices for Vespa use pre workout, post workout, morning? Pre work, we just, thanks for the plug. I mean, we don't have to do this, but thanks for the plug. But yeah, you take it 30 to 45 minutes before your workout. And then if you're doing anything longer than two hours, every two, two and a half hours seems to be a, a good window to retake. And then if you're racing, you might want to bring some calories in. I always, I always, um, advise athletes to wait for what I call the switch go, to go off. So they take the Vespa and then they, they do their warm up. And even when you're fat adapter, you wanna, because it takes time when you're a, a fat burner, it takes, you're going from one metabolic state to another. Mm -hmm. So it takes time to upregulate those, those pathways to get the fat burning. And it's what I call the switch. And you just know it because you, know, you get 45 to 75 minutes into a workout and all of a sudden it's like, okay, I'm ready to go all day. Yeah. You right? That second engine kind of turns on. That, that, that's the engine. So everything's upregulated. And you let that go, and then once that's kicked in, if you're fat adapted, you can start adding calories, and it won't kick you out. Mm. And then the ca then those extra calories. And I do advise, actually, unless it's really cold and you need the dense calories to maintain body heat, mm. I actually advise for simpler carbohydrate sources of, of calories because, you know, they transfer the gut quicker and 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 all that rather than than you know the fat things. Yeah. Is, is there's a lot of digestive cost, and when you're racing, you want to minimize that. Totally. Yeah. You want it to be quick, too. Yep. You know. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Gosh, we covered so much, Peter. Well, first of all, I want to thank Alessandro Freddy for introducing us. Cause, oh, cause that was Alessandro. Good. And that's, that's something I want to work on more because yeah. the, the HRV is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's key. Uh, speaking of HRV, there's three final questions we, have, we ask every guest. And the uh, first one is your morning routine. Um, you know, do you like to, what, you know, we know that productive people, in, you know, influencers in the world, do a certain, you yeah, have like rituals, things that... I, I need help, I need help in that environment. Yeah. You, usually it's, it's have a cup of coffee with heavy cream. I, I'll put some sugar in it, I'm not going to lie, but, but that's the thing, once again, this binary thinking. A teaspoon of sugar is 16 calories. Right. whoop do. doo whoop do. doo Yeah, especially because you know. you're physically active. We're right, sitting around all day, and I, I won't I won't get hungry till two or three o'clock. Mm. It's just easy, and I can go all day on that. That's what I've been doing today, mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. Um, do you like to train in the morning? I don't, but I do. Yeah. I mean, I like to. I like. I actually like to go out and run on the trails in the mountains. That's, that's, what gets me going because the beauty of being out in nature just kind of helps me get over it. But I'll go out and pound the pavement when I have to. I'm not. I wish I was more active. I, I actually, you know, I, like you, I've got little kids, and it's it's a free for all in the morning. And, yeah, getting them know. ready for school and the whole thing. Right, right. Yeah. And then you know, if I'm traveling, I've got stuff going on. I, I typically my typical thing is going out for really long runs because it's not only good for me to train and keep that fat adaptation. Right now, I'm just maintaining a base, mm. but it also it's great thinking time. I just, oh, yeah. I don't know what it is, but you get out there in the natural environment and you're just kind of cruising along and do my best thinking. I wish mm -hmm. I could remember it. Yeah, yeah, you gotta <laughs> bring like a notebook or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. record. You get in that flow state and, and then yeah. you just really, things just come and you can synthesize. Yeah, and I'm not thinking like trying to think on a logic train in a didactic way. It's just like this open thinking and then these, these you start connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, it's yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. Um, if there's one herb nutrient botanical you just couldn't live without, you're on a desert island, vitamin D and omega-3s are covered, what are you bringing with you? Well, we're on a desert island in the tropics? Yeah. Coconut, coconuts. Coconut. Right. <laughs> coconuts, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, botanicals, I think there's a lot of power in them, but I think that, that, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, but I think that there's, for a lot of these things, there's, there's a lot of hyperbole. Yeah. You know, I think that people should just, you know, the, the, when we go back to those evolutionary pressures that shaped us, people weren't thinking about this. They weren't thinking about their nutrition or whether it was organic. Or they, you know, and, and they figured it out. Steve Finney said this too. He said that these, these ancient peoples, they had it figured out. And I think people should relax and, and use whole foods. It's, it's pretty, pretty simple, whole fresh foods. Uh, produce in season, fresh meats, you know, you can use, you know, but don't stress out if you need to use some deli meat in a, in a deli meats and cheeses in a pinch. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I, I think that that's one of the binary things, that's something we should talk about, is one of the binary yeah. things is, is a lot of this thing with both keto and healthy eating and the foodie movement, you know, a lot of it's, the undercurrent is fear. You know, it's like if you don't have this organic produce or this antibiotic hormone-free beef, grass-fed beef, you're going to die of mm -hmm. something. and, and the science just isn't there. Um, Chronic use, yeah, but just, you know, one-off situations. I don't think, you know, you know, this is a discussion my wife and I have all the time because she works in commercial agriculture as a researcher and the, the science just isn't there. You know, fresh produce is, for the most part, if you wash it and treat it right, the, there's a difference, but there isn't a huge difference. And in some cases, Organic can be more hazardous to your health because of things like aflatoxin in peanuts, mm -hmm. organic peanuts, or E. coli in, in, in fresh salad green type things. You know, those risks are real. Um, same thing with the, with the meat and stuff. It, it's like, yeah, there's, it's better, or the eggs, are, yeah, they're better, but it's, it's, it's not a huge difference. So if, you're, if you don't have the time, you just gotta go to the supermarket, just eat the fresh food. Yeah. If you don't have the budget, I see a lot of people who don't have the, the, the you know, the incomes to support that, and then they're stressing about their money. Mm -hmm. You know, so just, just make it doable for yourself and, 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 don't, and don't get caught up in all the fear. You know, it, it's, it's, um, it's just not worth it. Yeah. You know, the stress, once again, the stress is as bad, is, is, is impactful as not getting it quite, is, is, is much more impactful than not getting it quite right. If you get mostly right, I think you're, and not stressed about it, I think that's a good medium. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I never really thought about it from that perspective of, of the fear base, but it is, you yeah. know, kind of, it, it does. It's gotten to that point where it's gotta be, it's gotta be like this thing or else you're gonna die of this. Mm -hmm. and, that, it's like, and it's like I tell people, if you really want the best eggs, the absolute best eggs that are like orange yolks, you don't wanna know what those chickens are eating, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's worms and yeah. I yeah, have. yeah, yeah. And it's dead flesh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, we have backyard chickens, yeah. So, you, yeah. you know what chickens do. Yeah. Oh man, they they love meat. They love they'll eat anything. Chickens are uh, Yeah, they're yeah, there's a reason why they've survived this yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So cool. Too funny. Uh, so final question here. If you were to um, be trapped in an elevator with a politician for just thirty seconds and they turn to you and said, Peter you know, we really, we're going into a meeting right now, we want to influence uh, you know, the masses, cultural level. What policy can we influence that would really kind of move the needle? You know, what, what kind of comes to mind in, in like an elevator ride that you feel would really have a, a, an impact on society in terms of nutrition? In terms of, of lifestyle and nutrition. I think I'm in Steve's camp uh, about this, you know, you know, our bodies, just, just tell them the simple message that, that the reason we carry a lot of fat is that's what we're meant to. And I think this whole keto and, and a lot of this movement has gone off the rails. It's like our bodies carry the fat. We're meant to burn the fat. Let's, we need to teach the body to get back to that burning fat. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a simple enough message, like get the body. We need to look at the metabolism, not the food or the diet, because there's all these variables that impact it. It's like, what do we do to get the body back to wanting to burn fat rather than store it? Mm -hmm. That's the thing. It's like it, Right now, most of America, your body wants to store fat, right? right? It doesn't want to burn it. And, and as you know from your journey, once you get this thing going, it's really easable, easy and stable because you don't have that, that hunger trigger that's, mm -hmm. that overarching that's having you overconsume. Right. Yeah, 
Unless you buy into the dogma that you need to carb load and do all that, I find. Or even with the yeah. keto thing, everybody's going nuts on keto. It's still energy balance. It's like I say, with carbs, it's, it's carbs in cubed equals carbs metabolized plus carbs stored, mm -hmm. carbs as fat, right? right. Plus, plus carbs glycated, which is really scary, yeah. right? Yeah. And then with fat, it's, it's carbs, carbs in equals carbs out. But so if you have too much carbs, you're gonna you're gonna gain weight. It's just not gonna be as fast as, mm -hmm. as as the, with the as the, with the carbs, right? right? You're gonna still gain weight, and so you're not gonna you know just because you're eating a lot of fat doesn't mean there's you, a hall pass. The, yeah, there's a hall pass, or even even to say if you're stressed out or you got an underlying condition, you may not be able to metabolize that, all that mm -hmm. fat you're eating. You may be doing damage to yourself or setting yourself up for a fat day. you got to get your body first to, you know, like a lot of people, you know, we don't start them off in keto because that's not, they're not ready for it because that's, yeah. a, that's a big stress on the system. Right. That's right? a huge point. And for a lot of people, their first foray into health now is keto. Right. Because they hear about it and they, they go from junk food to keto and there's no like, let's work on detox, let's work on lifestyle. Let's sleep. look at this, you yeah. know, do you, yeah, you're stressing and, and it's like I say, you know, there's 101 ways to get keto wrong. And if you're trying to do it for athletic performance, there's 201 ways to, to get wrong. And that's, you know, to kind of finish up, this is one of the things that Steve and I have been talking about for the last two or three years. It's like with this explosion of keto, it's like, we're like, oh man, this could, this could go off sideways because there's so much advice out there. And, and you, know, you know, there's a lot of great communication, but it's, it's like, it's contextual. There's a lot going on. You know, like, like the keto games guys are really good about context and helping people dial themselves in and, and, you know, but there's there's so much out there that, that you know people can get it wrong and, and or they're not just ready for it. Right. You know? Yeah. Love uh, that advice. It's really really good. Awesome, Peter. Well, guys, thanks so much for tuning all the way in. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Check out VespaPower.com. Connect with Peter, and you have a blog too as well. Or is uh, it I'm starting to try to do some podcast stuff. We're 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 just in the throes of redoing our stuff because I I'm more interested in, in working with the clients thinking about this developing the business so I haven't been really good at the marketing so we're trying to we're trying good. to develop that I, 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 I it's just not in my nature I mean I love doing like these kind of interviews because I just like talking about it but yeah. but I'm not like out there trying to do it because there's always there's all this stuff to think about and, right. and work with athletes and I, I just haven't been able to, to get to the point of getting out there. That's why we need guys like you. Sure. Yeah, no worries. But are you taking clients on as well? I send a few people your way. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm actually trying to get a few people that I handpicked that get it about this. Barry Murray's one, uh, David Gretsch, Naomi Land, Amy Hamilton's new, and Tash Frazier. Got a small group of people who get it mm -hmm. that I'm working with right now. I, I've got a sort of, I'm, I'm coaching a few people, but uh, you know, it, it's hard to do both. You know, so I'm, I, I always want to stay on the front lines and, and know what the real world is, but um, not get, but also, you know, work on the, the big picture and trying to get this all going. But it's, 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 you know, this is the stuff I love doing. Sure. Yeah. Cool. It's really, it's really cool. And there's, I think to end this up, what I'm seeing out there is there's a whole nother paradigm of, of performance, fitness, health, that whole triad. Yeah. out there with this whole fatation thing, but it's not this binary thing, right? right? Of it was carbs, you know, and now it's keto. It's it's something, you know, for each person to achieve that performance potential. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, there's another level out there, but it's it's not like this clear cut path. Right. So Yeah, I mean let's let's kind of maybe just finish off with that. I mean it, it, would it be fair to say that we kind of need the foundation to be fat adapted. And then we sprinkle in carbohydrates based upon that's, that's right. your health, your exercise intensity, your sport, and keeping in mind why you went keto or fat. That's the, right. And that's why, you know, I had this, I developed, I got this brainstorm of developing this OFM pyramid, which is, you know, and that's, that's exactly right. The fat adapted metabolic base is your base, mm -hmm. right? And then we work up from that nutrition instead of calories, mm -hmm. right? Focusing yeah. on the nutrition. And then, you know, stomach and gut health. Right, because that's so key. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you know, and that's why I, I don't tend to make it so didactic and, and precise on the macros because if you have a good stomach and biome, your, you know, your body and your biome will figure it out as long as you're getting the right inputs, the basic right inputs. You can't, perfecting it is too much stress. Right. 
And then we look at training and lifestyle hydration, which is a big one. Because to, when you're performing on fat, you're creating, we were talking earlier about this whole swing in temperatures, right? Yeah. I'm getting um, cold now as you're talking. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing. If you want to perform on fat, you're producing so much energy on a cellular level, you need to really focus on getting the, the hydration just dialed in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we look at strategic carbohydrates and then, you know, we put it all together. Yeah. Right? To get that zen. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, you know, if we want to really move people in the right direction uh, and, and be, be improve health on a societal level, yeah. having that conversation of it's not just high carb or it's not just always high fat, there's, there's some happy medium here. And so I think we can really... Yeah. I think the medium's more towards the keto side yeah. because people don't get, you know, we've been so imbued with the carb thing, people don't get, you know, that whole one teaspoon is fasting blood sugar thing, right? And how, you know, it tends toward it, but if you stay pretty much in that that fat adapted zone and you're athletic, then those forays into beer and pizza or yeah. <laughs> birthday cake as you got a daughter, right? Yeah. It's not gonna be the end of the world, right? Right. Your body's made to take, your body's actually made to take that kind of hit mm -hmm. if it's functioning right. That's, you know, when fruit was ripe, yep. right? Good point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is that medium, but I think people don't realize, most of the people, not people in the keto sphere, the adaptation sphere, but most of the people out there who are trying to be healthy, they really don't get how having a lot of carbs all the time really kind of keeps you out of, out of balance in terms of metabolism and hormonal balance. Mm -hmm. Fair enough, you yeah. probably agree yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Awesome, yeah. Peter. Thanks Looking for coming forward on. to it. This hey, is great. No, really it's been great. It. Look forward to doing more stuff with you. Absolutely.